Italian speaking Arabs that just finished nearly half a century of rule under a guy that refused to fly for more than eight hours, hated elevators, tried to crown himself King of Africa, and had a weird obsession with Condoleezza Rice. Yeah, and that's just the tagline. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. We are back in the Maghreb, North Africa. Okay, okay, so I know, I know, there's more to Libya than all that Gaddafi stuff. It's actually a country loaded with millennia of history and culture that extends beyond what modern news portrays. First off, let's pinpoint where Libya is, shall we? Ah, Libya, if only your visas were easily obtainable, you could become the next travel hotspot. Come on, you guys have like all those ancient ruins and nobody's visiting them. First of all, Libya is located in the North African region known as the Maghreb, with the longest coast on the Mediterranean Sea out of any nation in North Africa, bordered by six other countries. The country is divided into 22 districts, with the capital and most heavily populated district Tripoli in the north, whereas the least populated with only about 23,000 people being got located on the southwest along the border with Algeria. Keep in mind, many Libyans also refer to to the areas being located in one of three historical districts, Tripolitania, Fezzan, Cyrenaica. Also, fun fact, the name Tripoli means three cities as it used to be three separate cities that were unified, Oea, Leptis Magna, and Sabrata. After Tripoli, the next largest cities are Benghazi, yeah, that one. And Misrata, whereas the largest and busiest airports are Tripoli's International and Benghazi's Benina International. Now, Libya is interesting because it's like the one spot on the Mediterranean that has relatively untouched ancient sites that not too many tourists flock to, mostly because, you know, four decades of, uh, yeah. Getting around in Libya, you really only have like two options, fly or take a really, really long road trip. There are no railways or river transport systems and drivers heading south typically take extra jerry cans of fuel due to the unforgiving conditions that the vast empty terrain offers. Anyway, for Libya, cross desert roadways kind of go like this. Hey, Algeria. Yeah? You know, you got some great roads in the sandy deserts, especially that N1 Trans-Saharan Highway. Thanks, it took decades of allocating government funds for infrastructure investment. Yeah, yeah, whatever, that's great. Uh, can I like copy your homework? And can can I just like make a road that connects to your highway so I don't have to build through <sighs> Shad? Hey, I won the Aozu strip dispute, okay? Deal with it. Some places of interest might include spots like the ancient sites of Cyrene, Leptis Magna, and Sabrata, the Arch of Marcus Aurelius, Sabrata Theater, the Gurgi Mosque, the Clock Tower of Tripoli, the Museum of Libya, Severan Basilica, the Temple of Demeter, the Hadrianic Baths, the Red Castle Museum, Benghazi Zoo, the Amazigh Berber Cultural Towns, this ancient rock site that depicts savanna animals that once inhabited the area before it became a desert, and also a cool thing is the town of Gadamis, which is located in one of the largest oases in the country. Here you can run around and have the world's largest game of hide and seek. The guys from that show Departures did such a great documentary on it. I recommend it. I think it's on Netflix. Check it out. All right, moving on. <laughs> Now, the Sahara is a tricky, tricky desert because you keep finding these strange clues hidden all over that tell you an interesting story of life, death, prosperity, erosion, and eruption. First of all, Libya is the 16th largest country in the world and at 90% is mostly made up of the Libyan desert, a subsection of the Greater Saharan Desert, which is one of the driest, hottest places on Earth. In fact, the hottest air temperature ever recorded was at El Aziza at 57.8 degrees Celsius. If you look closer though, there's lots going on hidden amongst the seemingly grim, desolate terrain. For example, this large grayish dark area in the middle of the beige sand. This is the Haruj, one of the largest volcanic fields on Earth made up of over 150 Holocene volcanoes spread across 17,000 square miles. Yeah, Libya used to be a hotbed for volcanic activity a long time ago. Just to skip south, you find the most iconic volcano, the darkest spot on the map, while Anamus, probably the most remote and eerily beautiful natural landmark you can find in this world, complete with black sand, rocks, and an oasis at the bottom. It is really hard to get here and few people make it. If you do, take a picture and send it to geography later at gmail.com. A little further south, you hit the Tibesti mountain range, shared with Chad, where you can find the highest peak, Biku Piti, at over 2,000 meters. Now, when it comes to water, Libya is interesting because the sands lie on the underground Nubian sandstone aquifer system, the largest fossil aquifer in the world, holding around 150,000 cubic kilometers of water, which in return allows a complex patchwork of oases to pop up randomly throughout various spots in the desert. This in return has also allowed Libya to build the world's largest man-made irrigation system. Built by Gaddafi in five phases starting in 1991, the GMR, or Great Man-Made River, takes water from the aquifer and supplies water to desert communities throughout the underground pipes that go nearly 3,000 kilometers in overall length with over 1,300 wells. In addition, Libya hosts the ninth largest crude oil reserves in the world, largest in Africa, mostly heavily concentrated in the al Wahat district in the east. This alone makes up 97% of exports, mostly headed to Europe, and over half the nation's GDP. Oh yeah, the national animal is the Arabian eagle. Oh, and back in ancient times, there was this contraception 
deceptive plant related to sylphium grown in sirene, and it was used to extinction because, you know, back then, well, let's just say ancient or modern, some things never change with the Greeks. Oh yeah, uh, we gotta talk about food. Uh, okay. I asked some of you guys, the Libyan geography peeps, what I should mention, and here are some of the dishes you suggested. Couscous, bazin, asida, fatat, ospan, and macaruna and bacha. Yeah, you heard me right. Macaruna or macaroni. Lots of Italian influence here, okay? Let's cover that in. Uh, here's a story. Once upon a time, there was a room full of Arabs from all different countries, partying. Suddenly, one of them said, shh, shh, guys, guys, Libya's coming. Immediately, everyone started hiding their beers and shot glasses, straightened up, and upon Libya's entrance, they all said, oh, salam. Peace be upon you, brother. Okay, a little exaggerated, but Libyans are kind of like that guy when it comes to the Arab world. First of all, the country has about 6.5 million people and has only about three people per square kilometer. The majority of the country at about 97% is made up of Arab Berber peoples, whereas the rest is made up of small minorities of Turks, Egyptians, West Africans, and a few remaining Italians. The country also uses the Libyan dinar as their currency. They use the type D plug outlet and they drive on the right side of the road. Now let's go back to the ethnic thing though. Like most nations in the Maghreb, over half of the population identifies as having roots with the Amazigh, or Berber community, whether fully or mixed. Berber culture plays a strong yet historically disenfranchised role in Libyan society as it was suppressed during the Gaddafi years. We've discussed this before, but recap! Berbers are basically the nomadic natives of North Africa predating any Arab or Islamic settlement. They speak their own language and dialects. To this day, they hold fast to the long line of traditions, customs, and lifestyles that they're known for. For the first time in decades after the fall of Gaddafi, ethnic Berbers were able to celebrate their traditional holidays, speak their language openly, and even broadcast on new newspapers and radio stations. They were even able to teach Berber in schools with the unique writing system. Now add on top of that, Italy once colonized Libya for a short while, which is why Libyan Arabic has a slight Italian twang to it. They even use Italian words like forchetto and marcipiedi. Libyans are kind of seen as like the more conservative peoples of the Arab world, known for being the best Quran hafiz or Quran memorizers. Many kids grow up going to madrasas or schools that teach the Quran, and it's well known that Libyans usually win Quranic competitions worldwide. Okay, we're jumping around on way too many tangents. Let's organize this segment with a quick summarized history montage thing, shall we? Berbers, Phoenicians, Greeks, Cyrene was a very sexually active hedonist society, Romans, Arabs, Ottomans, Barbary Wars, Italian occupation, split between French and British, independence in 1951, very brief monarchy, all the Gaddafi years with drama, Gaddafi taken down, current civil war, and here we are today. Basically, when Gaddafi took power in a coup in 1969, things changed drastically, and he did some really weird things. He took his nomad tent abroad many times, he once even pitched his tent in Donald Trump's garden. He brought horses and camels with him on trips to Europe. He apparently crowned himself the King of Kings of Africa in 2008. He denounced Switzerland for some reason. He gave hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts to Condoleezza Rice upon her arrival visit in 2008. He composed a song for her and had a whole photo album filled with pictures of her. He refused to fly more than eight hours or go more than 35 stories high in any building. And finally, he had a female-only bodyguard troop. That last one kind of caught everyone off guard, but some claim apparently what I was told that it may have to do with the fact that Gaddafi had pissed off some Islamic extremist groups whom believed that they would be sent immediately to hell if they were killed by a woman, so strategy? But under his regime, some good things did kind of happen. In addition to the man-made river project, Medicare and electricity was free. Newlywed couples were given a $50,000 bonus by the government to start new lives. A portion of the oil wealth was stipend to the citizens. Literacy rates soared as education became free. Nonetheless, overall, it was a four decade long authoritarian dictatorship saturated with human rights violations after human rights violations until the Arab Spring revolutions happened and he fled and then he was killed in crossfire. After Gaddafi though, unfortunately transitional leadership became a source of contention and another civil war broke out in 2014. Today, the dispute is mostly head by three opposing parties, the Tobruk-led House of Representatives party in the East, which has the support of the National Army and has control of most of the oil fields. Then there's the General National Congress in the West, based in the capital Tripoli. And finally, you have the smaller Government of National Accord, or GNA. This is where the center of diplomacy begins when it comes to Libya's international outreach, which brings us to... <laughs> Now that Libya is kind of in an internal conflict, it really depends on which side of the civil war you support if you're gonna befriend Libya. It's incredibly complex and hard to explain, but to the best of my ability, this is what you guys, the Libyan geography peeps, have told me. Egypt is a close friend and shares a deep-rooted history and culture with Libya, but today they seem to favor the eastern Tobruk-led government, as does Russia and Saudi Arabia. However, despite efforts, the party doesn't seem to always get on board with many of their ideas. Turkey and Qatar have expressed support for the GNC, which is a source of controversy, as some Islamic militant groups have also pledged support to the party, 
which has allowed certain groups like ISIS access to the nation in the past. The UN and EU both show support for the GNA, the party that has the greatest amount of international support, but not much domestic. Nonetheless, if you kind of take all the politics outside of the equation, Tunisia and Algeria would probably be the best friends. Libyans love to go to Tunisia for tourism and medical treatment, and Algeria is like the big French-speaking brother that has always helped Libya in the times of need when things got very messed up, usually. In conclusion, if you take out everything modern, Libya is actually a land inundated with colorful backdrops of Saharan mysteries, both land-wise and people-wise. Let's just hope our visas get accepted. Stay tuned! You know it! Don't forget, little Liechtenstein.